Are you tired of being overcharged and forced into paying a monthly subscription for your Mac and Windows software? Well, if you are, currently we're having a 50% off discount on all the latest Mac and Windows software, such as AutoCAD, SolidWorks, Photoshop, Microsoft Office, and much more. Our 50% off discount will be ending soon, so be sure to text us Need Software to 213-640-9738. That's 213-640-9738. We aim to please, so expect 24-7 technical support, the latest premium software, instant software links delivered to your email, and PayPal Buyer's Protection Guarantee. doing now? They are doing four basic things. Racial showcasing, racial population tailoring, racial dislocation, and white sacrificing. And these four things are designed to produce maximum sophisticated confusion among the victims. And so far it's been somewhat successful. Racism is the most powerful system on the planet, yet it is often perceived is the most taboo subject to discuss. World-renowned activist and best-selling author Tariq Nasheed takes on this challenge head-on in his new book, Foundational Black American Race Baiter. This is the most important book you will need in order to understand the mechanisms of systemic racism and how to counter this system. Get Foundational Black American Race Baiter now at Amazon and BarnesandNoble.com. Also get limited autographed collectors options at tweakmachineofficialfba.com. All right. All right, I'm in here. <clears throat> All right, what's going on, family? We're here. All right. We're here. How y'all doing, family? Glad to have everybody tuning in, ladies and gentlemen. We are in here on this lovely holiday weekend. I hope everybody has um, been kicking in with the family. Hope everybody has had a great time. What's going on with y'all, man? I'm here. Shout out to Athens, Georgia. Let me get myself lotioned up real quick. Waiting on everybody to come on in the room. I'm good, man. I'm very good. I'm very, very good. Glad to have everybody tuning in. While everybody's hopping in the room, it's very hot out here in Los Angeles. I'm out here in LA and we are going through a heat wave. And this heat wave is not a joke, ladies and gentlemen. This thing is not a joke at all. What's up, Michael Wharton? What's going on, D. Tubman? All right. We're here. All right. Am I shadow banned? I hope I'm not shadow banned because people are saying that they're not getting their notifications. All right. People are saying that they're not getting their notifications and that ain't cool, all right? We need folks to get their notifications, all right? Um, I need everybody to retweet this, let everybody know that we're live because, you know, sometimes they play games with the streams. Sometimes people don't get notified the way they need to get notified and you know, it is what it is. Oh yeah, y'all like this shirt? This is from my brother, Dwan B. Dwan B, um, he has a YouTube channel. Our good brother, he's a music historian. He's going to be in the new documentary about hip hop. Um, this is the musical tree that um, he created, the Black American Music Family Tree. It talks about all the genres that we created as FBAs and how it related in pre C in in, in pre entered other genres. All right, it talks about how one genre influenced the next and influenced the next and influenced the next because we created all of it. So this is my brother Dwan B's shirt and he has, um, he, he sells the shirts and he sells like um, these paintings of them too. Real good stuff, all right, <clears throat> excuse me. But everybody hit that like button, hit the subscribe button again like I said, they play games with the notifications, but it's all good. We're here. We are here, ladies and gentlemen. A lot of stuff we're going to get into. Um, now, first of all, shout out to the family out there in um, Jackson, Mississippi. Um, 
We're trying to assist and help as many brothers and sisters as we can out there. They're going through the water crisis. You know, the white supremacists are up to their old tricks. Family, we have to understand, when we are trying to build things as black folks, we can never, ever, ever ignore the deeds of the white supremacists. That's a major mistake a lot of us make. We think we can get stuff popping without taking into consideration the moves that the white supremacists are going to make. A lot of black folks say, well, we, we is our own worst enemy. If we got ourselves together, white folks will just leave us alone. The reason white folks be attacking us because we attack ourselves. You know, y'all say all that plantation stuff, and y'all know the real deal. We all know the truth, family. The truth is, the white supremacists, no matter what we do, they're going to find a way to sabotage what we do. So the, the name of the game is to set ourselves up in a way where we, we can protect ourselves to a certain degree from the sabotage. That's the best thing we can do. We can do that as best as possible. Because again, we're under their prison system and the prison system is global. So they can pull all these different moves anytime they feel like it. And like I said, man, black folks, we don't take into consideration, we don't take the threat seriously where the white supremacists will sabotage what we got going on. Now, Jackson is a majority black city, and the game they play now is just to sabotage the environment. Family, the water sabotage, that's something that, that's an old trick. They've been doing that, family, and y'all forgive me for sweating. I'm sweating like crazy out here. I got my air conditioning on, but we're still going through a heat wave, and it's still very hot, even in my office. So y'all forgive me. So family, they've been doing the, the environmental sabotage for a minute. Even, um, you know, um, Flint, Michigan, they were doing it there. Um, going back to places like Oscarville, you know, they'll just flood a place. That's, that's another thing they would do. They would flood black areas. All of these black areas, they would just flood them. There's, a, there's so many rivers and lakes around the country that are actually man-made that were flooded by the white supremacists to kind of sabotage these self-sufficient black people. Going back to Tulsa, they just had to bomb that place because the black people there were so self-sufficient. They couldn't sabotage the water like they wanted to because I think the brothers and sisters were controlling their own water supply. So they're like, hey, we just gotta bomb this joint. We just gotta get up in planes and bomb this place. Um, Katrina, that's what they did in Katrina to displace the people, you see? When the white supremacists want to get some of these cities back, they start displacing the people and they start sabotaging the water. Out here in Southern California, I kept telling y'all about this historic place called Allensworth, California, about an hour or so north of Los Angeles. It's a small little tourist attraction now where it was a self-sufficient, small black town, some free black people after slavery, after they got free, they came out here, bought a plot of land and built this beautiful, cute little town with a school, church, shops, self-sufficient, and the white supremacists did the same thing. They started sabotaging the water. And then everybody had to leave, and now this place is a, basically, it's a standing museum. It's a standing museum piece. They use it as a tourist attraction in this small little area. They've always done that, all right? We can never take our eyes off what the white supremacists are doing. The best we can do is set ourselves up so that we can protect each other to the best we can. And we have to understand with the white supremacists, either they will start sabotaging the water and the environment or they'll get a Negro to go do the dirty work for them. You see, they'll get a Negro to do the dirty work for them. They'll go get a, an Eric Holder to a certain degree to go do the dirty work for them. If you're in California, y'all definitely have to take a trip up to Allensworth, ladies and gentlemen. It's a very cute little quaint place, man. It's great to see what our FBA family did and how thorough they were. Um, you know, we have to pay homage to them. We have to pay homage to our, our family. Learn 
from what they did and learn how they were sabotaged and then we have to figure out how we can present ourselves from being sabotaged like that. You did? Everybody hit that like button, hit that subscribe button. Hit the like button, hit the subscribe button. But as far as Mississippi, man, um, in Jackson, there's a black-owned um, water company. We've been sending money to them. I've sent money to about three, four different folks out there. I've sent a couple of thousand dollars to different organizations out there that's on the ground. Shout out to them. Um, I talked to my good brother, David Banner, who's from Jackson, Mississippi. That's David Banner's hometown. And he threw me on and hooked me up through some um, resources at me as far as um, some people to connect with down there. So I'm going to be reaching out to them to make sure the family is good because the water down there is so damn contaminated, man. It, it just looks like straight up poison. You dig? So we got to start looking out for the family. And, and what I don't like, family, is that we have our government who we pay taxes to. We pay taxes to our government. They're sitting here using your tax dollars and my tax dollars to allocate resources to non-citizens. They're allocating resources to non-citizens. They're sitting here using our tax dollars for illegal immigrants coming over here who don't have a real dog in the fight. Their only objective is to bring them over to undermine us and they're getting them chipped up and papered up and we up here have, we gotta sit here on a grassroots level to get money together for our family whose water's contaminated and that should be taken care of by the state. This is why we need tangible resources. Damn this whole taxation without representation in black family. We have to stop with the whole coalition nonsense. Do y'all understand? We're the only ones who end up suffering family we're running around here trying to talk about a minority coalition and a black and brown coalition. We do that nonsense in the brown people who ain't really brown, they're white. They get papered up and we're sitting here with dirty water and nothing. We have to stop that family. We have to stop being afraid to say, hey, black people, particularly foundational black Americans, we're going to need resources so that we can get these water supplies together. We have all of these cities with contaminated water, dilapidated housing and sewage systems, and we need to be able to take care of that. We need resources allocated specifically to us. None of that all lives matter stuff because everybody's water is not being contaminated. It's only happening in these black areas. Stop being afraid to say we need things for black people. The hell are you voting for? Do not vote unless we get some tangibles. This is further reason why we need tangibles, family. Stop playing games out here. We have to fix this mess. We out here scraping up money on our own after we pay taxes to get this stuff done. We need to be compensated for that, family. We got to be compensated. Let's stop playing these games with these politicians, ladies and gentlemen. And family, this is the crux of what we want to talk about. We want to talk about some of these Black Lives Matter activists, how they're getting thrown under the bus. And y'all need to listen. As we know, Patrice Cullors and all of these people, they've been throwing charges on the Black Lives Matter folks, they've been scattering and scurrying, scurrying like, like mice because of all the different charges put on some of these folks. They're saying that these folks are skimming millions and millions and millions of dollars. Every other week we hear about some kind of Black Lives Matter leader getting thrown under the bus because they said they stole some money. So now, a couple of days ago, this new dude, um, Shalom Maya, Shalamiah Bowers, they accused him of stealing 10 million. All right, they said he siphoned nearly $10 million in fees from donors to pay for his consulting firm. The new leader of the National Black Lives Matter nonprofit siphoned $10 million, blah, blah, blah. So I can go into the story, so this is him. All right, 
for this saying this dude finessed some money. And this dude in here, um, what what is him? Okay, this is this is him right here, okay? So this brother is LGBT. Alright, oh, we gotta point that out. As we see, this is an LGBT brother. Alright. He's an LGBT brother. Now, why do I point that out? Because a lot of these folks clicked in with Black Lives Matter, some of these so-called leaders. You notice a lot of them are LGBT and they were all on this intersectionality, all trans lives matter, black and brown. They were the main ones promoting that stuff. They were flunkies for the white Democrats. Yes, he does look non-FBA. But these people were flunkies for the white Democrats. All right. And they get out here and the Democrats, the white Democrats, elevate them, give them airtime, give them prestige, give them titles, and let them be the front people of these organizations while the white supremacists are in the back getting the brunt of the money. All right. The white supremacists are in the background getting most of that money. All right. So they get their LGBT Negroes and they pull them to the side and tell them how different they are from black society. You guys are different and y'all buy it hook, line, and sinker. Y'all sit here talking about you're an intersectionalist, intersectionalist and you believe in intersectionality and all of that stuff. And they sit up here and promote you and promote you and promote you and you think that you're in there. You think that you're something other than a black person. They promote you and what they're doing is setting you up to be the fall guy. So when there is an investigation about where all that money went, they put your dumb asses all the way in the front. Because there's like 90 million, 100 million, there's a lot of money that was collected by Black Lives Matter, which is really the, these white organizations. It's these white organizations that really collect the money. So if they're saying he took 10 million, it's the white folks in, in the background somewhere that you don't see who took about 70 million. White folks ain't gonna let no nigga out finesse them, all right? Let's be clear. One thing white people ain't gonna do, if you gonna pull a finesse, you ain't gonna out finesse them. They gonna get more out of the finesse and then they gonna put you in the front so you can be the fall guy. Notice they keep pushing these black folks in the front to be the fall guys for all of this money that's being st stolen. You dig? They sit up here, and it's the liberal media who pushes this stuff. It's the liberal media who elevates you, and it's that same liberal media that says, hey, by the way, that intersectional, intersectional LGBT Black Lives Matter leader bought all these houses. Now go, go investigate them. And don't look over here at us with all the houses we bought. We ain't telling you what we bought, but they bought, ooh, they bought $6 million in houses. You see? They're throwing them under the bus while they get all the money. So you got to watch out for that. See, I'm not, that's why I don't dump, I'm not going to dump on them too, too hard. I'm not going to dump on them too, too hard because I understand the game. But you shouldn't walk into a finesse. You shouldn't walk into where these white supremacists are going to finesse you. And let me understand, let me let you understand something. They start grooming these people young. This um, Shalamaya, that ain't his real name, by the way, I don't think. They groom these people real young. They've been grooming this guy, getting him ready for the finesse, because he's been around for a minute. His real name is Christman. And here's a video of him when he's real young. This is him back in 2008. This is him in 2008 talking at some kind of um, event where they're doing a mock trial. So this is him. This is him. Whoa, 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 where we at? Hold on, hold on. So this is him. That's him at a, you know, he's young. He's a, a young teen right now. developing a variety of complex skills, including research and critical thinking skills, techniques of persuasion, debate and discussion, tools for mock trial, and team building and leadership methods. Okay, so I'm showing you that because as you can see, there's a little lisp. Okay, so you can tell there was a little lisp and he was young. Okay, let me tell you something. So they saw that this boy, there was some moisture going on when he was a kid, a young'un. They saw there was some moisture going on, so what they do, they get them kids, 
they get him, they see some moisture going on, and they get him and they start grooming him young. Yeah, he has has a little Tevin Campbell vibe going on. They get him young, they're like, oh, okay, yeah, we got him. Come on in. Let's get you hooked to some programs. They start grooming these, these kids who are a little moist. They groom them young. They get them and then they put them in these little programs and, hey, we're going to give you a little grant. We'll give you a little scholarship. We'll give you a little allowance to join this group and this organization and we'll give you all types of resources. They groom them young and then set them up to be leaders of these organizations that the white supremacists set up so they can use them as the fall guy. You see, this is why, family, we got to watch all of these RICO charges that are put on people like rappers. Like you got Fannie the Mammy out there in Atlanta. Fannie Willis. Fannie Willis. Fannie the Mammy out there. She's acting like the plantation mammy. She's going out there big and bold in Atlanta, putting all of these RICO charges on rappers, quoting rap lyrics. She didn't put a RICO charge on Young Thug and Gunner and all of these people. And there's some Negroes out here who low-key celebrates that stuff. Y'all better stop that because she sits here in capes for the race soldiers. She's not going to punish the race soldiers, but she's throwing the brothers under the bus. My thing is, I don't believe in racial um, preferences. I don't believe in racial preferences when you are going to punish people for a crime. One group of people shouldn't get away with crime and others get punished. We can't promote racial double standards. That's why the system of white supremacy has lasted so long. We've sat here and co-signed racial double standards. If you kill somebody unjustly, your ass should be punished. You shouldn't be able to get away with killing people just because you're white. And black folks shouldn't be overly punished just because white people said you were born the wrong color. But yeah, you out here protecting race soldiers within law enforcement, that's not a good thing. That perpetuates the system of racial non-justice. And even with these RICO charges, they sit here and quote rap lyrics and everybody connected to the black-owned production company, they get hit with RICO charges. But if you're going to do that, notice you never see the white distributor of these racial of, of these criminal lyrics they never get charged with rico so if if young thug and those people are using their lyrics to promote a gang and they're making money and this is a criminal enterprise why are only the black people connected getting charged then you're not running up in the record labels charging them and they're making the brunt of the money you dig? They've been doing that. Even with, when back in the days of Death Row, they were doing that stuff with Death Row Records. Death Row Records was getting all the investigations and all the RICO investigations and all this stuff. And when Death Row started, they were right next to Interscope. Interscope was, they were like in the same building. Interscope would never get investigated. The white side of the label who were making, they were making all of the money. They were distributing all of the criminal lyrics and all that. They weren't getting investigated. All the black ones, all the black artists are going to jail. Even with Priority Records, they're doing investigations on Ruthless and all of these other people. They never put RICO charges on the white people, Brian Turner and all those people at Priority. And they distributed all of this black music that was so gangster and everybody's getting investigated. Did, did no Limit get investigated at one point? Priority was their um, um, distribution. Did No Limit get investigated? So many people got investigated, I would be surprised if they didn't. You did But yeah, all of the distributors who, is making, who are making the money, they're not getting investigated. Yet Murder, Inc. Murder, Inc. gets investigated. Their distributor's not being investigated. Um, Rap-A-Lot, that was distributed by Priority. They sure investigated Jay Prince. They've been trying to put all types of charges on Jay Prince for decades. Not, not priority. You see? Notice all it's always the black people getting investigated. Hit with the RICO, that if it's a criminal enterprise, then everybody's involved who's making money from the criminal criminal enterprise, they should be on the hook. Not just the black ones. You know? I don't co-sign racial double standards. 
They tried to get Kane and those guys to testify on Master P. Wow. Wow. You then? So do not co-sign racial double standards, family. Y'all retweet this. Let, me, let everybody know I'm live, family. Let everybody know that I'm live right now. But like I said, the thing is, black cities get targeted. And you know what's interesting? Certain cities where black folks stood up for themselves, they tried to erase that. Speaking of black towns and black people being sabotaged, y'all know I always talk about a city called Cairo, Illinois. <clears throat> Cairo, Illinois. And there are a lot of YouTube videos about Cairo, Illinois now. Um, Cairo, Illinois is pretty much a ghost town now. And if you look on YouTube, a lot of white people like to go there and sightsee and they, they like to low-key hate on it. Let me show y'all some of the, the video titles of Cairo, Illinois. They like to hate on Cairo, Cairo, Illinois. It's really Cairo, but they pronounce it Cairo. All right. Hold on. Let me show y'all this. These are some of the videos you can see. Cairo, Illinois, the eerily empty town that's almost abandoned. Um, public housing crisis could be an end. Cairo, Illinois, the worst ghost town in the Midwest. Cairo is the most dangerous town in Illinois, and you should never go there, especially at night. The saddest town in America. Look at how they talk about it. Cairo, Illinois, death of a city. All right. Look at how they talk about it. They talk about it like it's a horror movie. Don't ever go there. All oh, the ghost of the Negroes will get you. Let me tell you something. The white supremacists, they, they don't forget when they catch an L. I told y'all about Cairo before. Cairo, Illinois, is a town that's situated right in the middle of America. This town is right by a number of waterways that are very strategic. This Cairo, Illinois, is very strategically placed in this country at one point, they were talking about making Cairo, I'm talking about in the 1800s, they wanted to make that the capital of the United States because it was so central to the waterways because that's how they would travel at the time. They, the, the waters and the rivers were the superhighways. So strategically, this is a phenomenal place to be. So why haven't they rebuilt Cairo, Illinois? Why haven't they rebuilt it and why is it basically a tourist attraction? Well, what happened was, um, they were subjugating the black people there and lynched some black people there. And in the 1960s, in the late 60s, black people said enough is enough. The black people, and there was a, a strong black militant movement happening in the late 60s, early 70s. Yeah, they don't tell you about Cairo. We're gonna talk about Cairo in the new movie, American Maroon. Listen, Cairo, Illinois, the black folks said, you know what, damn this. Damn all of these ass whoopings, police brutality, they're not giving us jobs. Black folks say, you know what, we ain't got nothing to lose. And they gave this, the black folks there gave the officials an ultimatum. Either y'all provide jobs for us, put your police department on the leash, let's get some equal resources going on, or we're going to put foot to ass and test us if you think we're bluffing. The white supremacists thought they were bluffing. The brothers went out there and put in work. Them brothers started whooping ass out there. They started shooting up the police station, destroying the white businesses there, putting foot to ass out there. The local sheriff, the white sheriff even got shot. They shot him and ran him out of town. He went to Washington, D.C. talking about, hell, can I get a white civil rights bill? Y'all need to do something. But they couldn't do anything in D.C. because so many people were turning up around the country. So D.C. was like, hey, man, you know, hell, this fires and this, these Negroes are acting a fool everywhere. We, don't, we can't do nothing for you. You on your own. So the black folks ran all the white people out. The black folks ran the white people the hell up out of there. And the white supremacists, boy, they don't, 
they don't really want to go rebuild it. If they rebuild it, they got to change the name and all of that stuff because, you know, they don't want to move to a city where they took a major L like that. Yeah, they really shot the sheriff. So, yeah, if you go to Cairo, Illinois and rebuild, people are going to start asking about the history. You got to talk about that big L that the white supremacists took. They don't really want to talk about that. They don't want to talk about that L, how they got ran the hell up out of there. Yeah? So now they sit up there and ain't really hard. It's a few people. There ain't really that many people there. But eat, let the white supremacists tell it. Oh, it's so dangerous. If you go there, zombie Negroes will get you. They almost make it seem like the walking dead if you go there now. It's, it's damn near abandoned. And they're still shook. Oh, it's so dangerous. No, it's not. But I, got, I digress. I digress, ladies and gentlemen. And speaking of um, deaths, there's a journalist up there in um, Las Vegas. He's an investigative journalist, very well respected. This guy was doing, his name is Jeff um, German, Jeff German. He was um, doing an investigative story he was working on a story kind of outing some more of those people from the Oath Keepers white supremacist group he was doing an investigation on the white supremacist group the Oath Keepers he's a very well respected investigative journalist and somebody got at this dude investigative journal journalist reporter Jeff German stabbed to death in Las Vegas they caught him outside of his crib and stabbed him to death it's real out here man It is real out here, ladies and gentlemen. When some of these white people so-called get off code and start snitching on these white supremacists, they, they make an example out of them. Yeah, they were making an example out of him. Like, hey, yeah, don't, don't, don't get off the white supremacist code. See, we let folks, folks can get off code around us and you know, it's just, it is what it is. When the white supremacists get off code, they make an example out of them immediately. You ding? We in here have everybody retweet the broadcast. Let everybody know that we're live right now. Everybody retweet this. Let everybody know that we're live right now. Let me get a retweet. Everybody hit that share button and, and share this now. Did y'all hear the story on with Tiffany Haddish and Ari Spears? And I've had Ari Spears on before. Right now, there's a, supposed to be some kind of lawsuit against Tiffany and Aries for some child sexual stuff. Now, I think the lawsuit is over the top, and I think that the woman pushing the lawsuit, you know, I think she's trying to get a bag. I think she's been doing this for a minute. Yeah, I'm talking about the Aries Spears thing now. Okay, they said I'm shadow banned here. Okay, so y'all have to retweet this and share this. I don't know why they pull that shadow ban stuff on. Well, I do know, but it is what it is. It is what it is. We're still trucking. We're still keeping on what we're doing. All right? So, this thing with Tiffany Haddish and Ari Spears, this woman is suing them, saying that she, Aries and her used the woman's kids for a skit, they did some kind of YouTube skit years ago, and it was a it was supposed to be about the eyes of a predator, and they they had the kids in their underwear and they were, you know, looking at the kids sexually, and the kids were doing sexual gestures with certain items, and you know, I, I somebody sent. Uh, an edited clip. I saw a little. I, I saw like a couple of seconds of it. I'm like, oh, this is enough. This is enough for me. Um. Now the thing is, the skit was in very poor taste. Was it in poor taste? Yeah, my God, very very poor taste. I think they were trying to be real edgy. Very very poor taste. But again, I still think the the woman. You know, I think she's still trying to get a bag, though. She's been trying to get a bag out of Tiffany. So I don't know about that. You, you dig? 
I don't know. Yeah, man, I, I saw enough. I, yeah, I saw an edited version. I don't really want to see the rest. I don't want to see the rest, man. Again, I just think that they were just trying to be over the top and edgy, and it was, nah, nah. So the, they saying that the mother and Tiffany was in a relationship. I don't know. There's a lot of rumors. Oh, it's the daughter suing? I, okay, I don't know who's suing. Yeah, I, yeah, you don't want to see this skit. The mother is not suing. The children are suing. Okay, so now the, the daughter is an adult now, so the daughter is suing. Okay, all right. Because I've been hearing a lot, a lot of different stuff about it. I've been hearing a lot of different stuff about it. So, ah, uh, it was, yeah, was it in bad taste? Yes. They need to come on out and say, yeah, it was in bad taste, but yeah, we didn't have any criminal intent. Yeah. Man. That is what it is. It is what it is. But again, you know, I, I, yeah, they, they kind of need to come out and say, hey, you know, this ain't it. You know, we did some, we did something that was very, very much in poor taste. And just leave it at that. No, Tiffany Haddish is Eritrean. She's Eritrean. It ain't, she is not, um, she's not FBA. She's Eritrean. Or is, he, is she half Eritrean? I know her, her dad. She's half, okay, she might be half FBA. Okay, all right, all right, that's what it is. Okay, by the way, guys, y'all join us in, um, y'all join us soon in Atlanta at the Revolt Summit. It's gonna be on and popping, ladies and gentlemen. The Revolt Summit is popping in a couple of weeks. We're gonna have a, an explosive panel down there. Go to revolttv.com or Revolt Summit com and get your tickets for the Revolt Summit in Atlanta, the 24th and 25th, I think. We're going to set it on fire with, with good information. Um, me and my sister Teslin, we're going to be on a panel there speaking hot fire. Yeah. So, a lot of other stuff going on here. Um, the documentary we're doing about hip-hop, that's going to be soon. We're going to go out we're going to be going to New York and all over the country to start filming on that pretty soon. We're going to start filming on that real soon. I can't wait to do that. I'm very excited. I'm trying to finish up on the American Maroon documentary. This documentary is going to be phenomenal. Um, I, I think we're going to have some theatrical screenings because it's kind of long. It's a little over three hours, I think. We're still doing the editing. I think it's going to be a little over three hours. What I want to do... Hopefully some of the theaters will let us show something that long. And we want to do some screenings, hopefully by December. I keep everybody hip to that. I'll let everybody know what's going on with that, ladies and gentlemen. Because we got to get our culture back and we got to claim our culture because, look, this is important because people are trying to erase us physically and culturally. And we have to say, hey, enough is enough. And it's, this is not just about hip hop. This is just about FBA culture, period, family. This is all about our culture, period, because if we let them do this, it doesn't stop. Like I said, I put up a clip the other day. There's an Italian dude talking about we need to give Italians credit for helping create hip hop. It's just all over the place. It's all over the place. It is. Shout out to Chicago checking in. Yeah. All right. But it doesn't stop. It, people will try to take credit for all of the hip hop. They'll try to take credit for R&B. There was a white dude on Twitter we were going back and forth with today. He was low key trying to give some other people credit for jazz. Look at the interaction we have with this guy, this Eric... Um, Eric Weinstein guy. We were having a little thing back and forth with this guy. Check this conversation out. He was like, um, yeah, I don't see any path back, at least tonight. I was looking forward to this speech and it was bad. We're determined to continue to unravel this amazing country. 
gonna go listen to some live blues where no one cares about race. Thankfully, there's a two drink minimum. And a lot of people are kind of correcting him, myself included, like, well, nobody's thinking about race with blues? Man, blues was created by foundation of black Americans based on the way they were racially marginalized. Man, black folks created blues because they were having the blues and the white people were giving them the blues. The white supremacists were giving black people the blues. So you see how people try to rewrite history? Just like with hip hop. See, this is why we got to get back to the essence of hip hop. They try to all lives matter and hip hop was a foundation of black American creation in response to white supremacy. It was black people who could not get into the mainstream. You couldn't get into the disco clubs. You couldn't get into the music schools. You couldn't get into certain job markets as, as foundation of black Americans. So black people created their own culture. We'll use this park. This park will be the club for us. We can't get into art school. Well, we'll use the walls of the city and the subways as our art school. Yeah. We can't get in the DJ booth at the Studio 54s and all of these clubs. The microphone and the two turntables, that will be our studio booth. That was in response to white supremacy. Same thing with blues. Remember, hip hop was growing at the same time the 5%er movement was growing. Hip hop was growing around the same time the 5%er movement was growing and this was coming right out of the Black Panther movement around the same time. We can't leave that stuff out. But this white man on Twitter, he kind of doubled down a little bit. He doubled down. Listen to what else he, look at what else he had to say. Because people were calling him out and he was like, that the blues came from the South, yes. That the blues were almost, ex almost exclusively black back then, yes. Although they borrowed, but yes, that the black folks were oppressed. Don't know if anybody would disagree that this is why they were developed. That's very simplistic and not clear. Okay, I don't know what he's talking about. But who the hell did black people borrow blues from? He wouldn't elaborate on that. Who did black people borrow the blues from? What was borrowed? You see how these people, they'll say some stuff? When it comes to our culture, they'll come around and just say something real reckless and then run. Like, hey, Latinos co-created it 50-50 and then run and hide. And they're like, hey, 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 how? How did you co-create it 50-50? Well, who, who, who? We just did, man. Come on, man. Don't be divisive. We just did. No, what are you talking about? Yeah, blues, y'all borrowed that, but yeah. From who? Who the hell did we borrow the blues from? Except other black people. Blues coming out of gospel. Who did we borrow the blues from? You see? It, it, it ain't gonna just stop with hip hop, guys. This ain't just about hip hop. This is about just erasing our culture and then people colonizing it and taking claim on it. You see? That's why we gotta cut that stuff short and just get it on out the paint early. We gotta get them out the paint with these lies very early, ladies and gentlemen. Man, we've created so many genres and subgenres. We're talking now about there's a sister, Tina. What is Tina? What's Tina's name? There's a sister up in Seattle who actually created grunge music. It's a foundational black American woman up there in Seattle who created grunge music in the 80s. In fact, her band, she had a band, I forgot what the band's name was. She was the lead singer of the band. Kurt Cobain was a roadie for her band back in the day when he was young before he got put on. Tina Bell, that's her name. Kurt Cobain was a roadie for her band. And when you think of grunge, Kurt Cobain in his movement, that's the face of grunge. He was a roadie for this woman. You see, Tina Bell, that's her name. Her son is a, 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 an Oscar winning um, um, 
movie producer. He did a couple of documentaries. Her son. She had a son with a white man. TJ something. T, her son is TJ something, but he won a, like an Oscar for a documentary. I think the documentary was Undefeated or something like that. Bam Bam. The band is Bam Bam. Yeah. Family, did you also know Punk Rock? There was a, a, a foundational black American group out of Detroit who created Punk Rock. There was a group, we're learning all of this stuff. We're learning about all of these subgenres that we created that nobody even knows we created. When, when you think of punk rock from the late 70s, you think of the groups like the Ramones and all of these people. There were some brothers in Detroit, early 70s, called Death. The name of the group was Death. I want y'all to look that up. These brothers were doing punk rock in the early 70s, but... They couldn't really get any mainstream traction because in the 70s, you know, this was Soul Town in Detroit. You know, the Motown thing was really popping. These guys wanted to be different. They created a different sound. They did some, some little recordings that, you know, went underground. And nobody ever heard of them no more. And their little underground recordings started going to the white underground little clubs and stuff like that. And bam. Here they go. They created punk rock music off these brothers. You know? And you never hear about these dudes. You never hear about this group called Death out of Detroit. I want y'all to look them up. Yeah, the music was so ahead of its time, they just couldn't get an audience for it at that time. Nobody was ready for it. You know? Nobody was ready for that. You know, they had like a little single that they put out in 1975 and then they had to reissue, they reissued a lot of their stuff later in the 2000s because so many people were paying like eight, $900 for their singles on the underground market. Yeah, Pearl Jam is from Seattle. All of that grunge stuff, yeah, they got it from the sister. Yeah, Jimi Hendrix from Detroit, yes. The name of the group is Death. The name of the group is Death. Somebody said, um, Denzel is Caribbean, man, please. They don't stop. So we created a lot of these little genres, man. We've created so many genres. We Again, we create stuff and just back up off of it. So look, in the 70s, we created grunge. No, they have grunge. Well, grunge was in the 80s. In the 70s, we created funk, disco, hip hop, punk rock, and then later in the later 70s, house music. So we can point to parallel music creations that we were doing. That's why I take offense when we hear about all of these other groups who co-created stuff with us, then what else were you creating? How come you didn't create any type of parallel genres on your own? We have parallel genres that we can point to and say, hey, we created that while we were creating all of this other stuff. Yeah, P-Funk, another form of funk, the P-Funk. That comes out of, you know, Bootsy leaving James Brown's band. Bootsy brought that James Brown funk to Parliament because remember, Parliament was kind of on some rock funk stuff. They were very experimental. Parliament's early stuff was extremely per experimental. They want some hippie stuff. They got with Bootsy. Bootsy said, hey, when I was with James Brown, he taught me how to hit that thing on the one. George Clinton was like, what's that? You hit it on the one, hit that funk on the one, and just groove and just keep coming back to that one. Bootsy taught George Clinton about the one, and they were funking out ever since. You yeah. So Bootsy got with, with George Clinton and with James Brown, everything was very rigid. You better hit it like I told you to hit it. James Brown had, the, it was that was that Ike Turner thing. You better play this mother effer like I wrote it. Play it just like I wrote it. Play it just like I want to hear it. Yeah, Bad Brain, Fishbone, I'm not, I didn't forget about them. So, Bootsy was with James and James was very rigid. 
But when he got with um, George Clinton, it was like, hey, man, let's hey, let's just be free spirited. Let's funk it up and just kind of you feel something. Let's throw it down here. Ain't no rules. Ain't no parameters. Let's just do what we feel and just keep it funky. And keep hitting it on the one. And that's when we got these classic records from Parliament. And that was when that Bootsy connection came through. They got together and just tow it up. Yeah. Yeah, then we created New Jack Swing. We created all of these new genres. Yeah, there was another rock band, Living Color. Remember them? Fishbone, Living Color. Fishbone was the shit, too, by the way. Yeah? A black rock band. So, yeah, we've been doing this stuff, family. This is stuff that we've been doing. It's nothing new. So this is why we got to take ownership of our culture. Because, again, these people are trying to get us out the pain. They're trying to get us out the pain, and they're using all types of dirty tactics to gentrify these areas. Yeah, body count. Shout out to my good brother Ice-T. Body count. That's another thing. Yeah, my, my man Ice-T gets busy with body count. But like I said, man, they're trying to get us out the pain. They're using dirty tactics. They're using um, the environment to sabotage us. They're using janky, racialized Nuisance laws, man, there was something I've been telling people about these nuisance laws that they keep pulling on us. There's a, a story that just came out out here in L.A. There was a sister who owns a building down in South Central L.A. Now, they done put a nuisance ordinance on this sister. They're trying to take her building by claiming gang activity. So like I say, they skip over all of these white-owned apartment buildings and find, and find the black owners and then hit them with nuisance ordinances because of gang activity around the area that the black business owners don't have anything to do with. I want y'all to check this out. Check this out here. Hold on. Hold on. All right. Hold on. An apartment building in South L.A. has been accused by the city attorney of doing nothing to stop gang activity. And now the property owner is speaking out. She says she's actually trying to do everything right in a community that needs help, not more problems. Tonight, Joy Benedict takes us to East 41st Street for a story you'll see only here on KCAL 9. It's a neighborhood lined with homes filled with families. Five miles south of City Hall, east of the 110 Freeway, in the heart of South Los Angeles. Well, how long have you been here? But on East 41st Street, the city has labeled this building as a nuisance for gang activity. You're very surprised I got a lot of phone calls saying that your property's on the news, your name is in the news. Tamika King is the one being sued by the city. She goes by the name Nina Rose. I spent hundreds of thousands of dollars remodeling this place with new windows, new floors, bathrooms to do everything I need to do to have a nice place over here for these people. She says her building is not what they make it out to be. Because if it wasn't for her, me and my kids would have been on the street with nowhere to go. I've housed over 50 women and children here off the homeless program. She says the lawsuit lists a bunch of issues that she didn't know anything about. There have been sh two shootings connected with this property. Numerous arrests for uh, illegal gun possession. In a news conference last week, the city attorney and police chief accused Rose of not doing her part, but she says they're not telling the whole story. When they made me aware of the situation that they came in and found guns, and one of the apartments here, those people have been removed. She says apartment A has now been vacant for months. And this lawsuit was actually filed back in May. And she's been working with the city attorney's office ever since. This is old. They made it seem like it was filed last week. I don't know if it was some type of political motive. And she says the city is missing the real problem. These kids want something to do. There's no outlet. There's no resources for these kids over here to do that. The only thing promised to these kids is death in jail. Something others in this neighborhood are saying as well. The crisis that they're putting on her, she inherited this problem. It's not like they started gangbanging when this building came. It's not gangbanging, it's poverty. And others are coming to Rose's defense. Real talk. And she allowed us to have the repass at her venue. Nicole Moore's cousin was killed in the Windsor Hills crash last month that killed six people. She says Rose, who also owns other businesses in the area, offered up her event venue after the service. She didn't charge us 
literally anything. Miss Rose says this building has been in her family for more than 40 years. It is currently owned by a trust in the names of her three children. I'm kind of one of the only probably black landlords left on this block. Real talk, real talk. She says trying to tear her down or her community isn't a good look for Los Angeles and it won't help her neighborhood get what it truly needs. Help me with some resources to help these kids help themselves. Joy Benedict, KCAL. Dude, there's only a handful of black landlords out here in LA, man. Notice the pattern? Remember a few weeks ago, down in Long Beach, a Mexican dude got drunk or high, he might have been high, and crashed into somebody's apartment. They tried to blame the black man in Long Beach who owned the bar, claiming that the bar got the Mexican drunk, and that's what made the Mexican man crash into the building. So they, they're trying to shut the man, the black man's business down. I told y'all, man, they do some real funny style stuff out here, man. They do real funny style stuff out here. Yes, I want to support that sister. I want to find out. I'm going to find her presence on social media. And we want to support that sister. I want to reach out to her to make sure she's good. You, whenever we're out here doing the right thing, because what they don't like, notice when it's black people actually helping the black community, the, we're the ones who get targeted. You see, when it's black folks out here helping other black people, yeah, this Nipsey part two, Nipsey got a building, he has a business, and he's helping out other black people. All of a sudden, some random dude comes up and kills him. You, you see? That's not a coincidence. Remember, they, they labeled Nipsey's shop a nuisance zone too. I've been telling y'all for months this is what they do out here in L.A. All the black businesses, they try to get them out of there, and they just all they have to do is just say, well, that's a nuisance zone. Why? Because I'm white and I say so. How the hell is the black business a nuisance zone, but all the Asian, Arab, white businesses are not nuisance zones? How come all the liquor stores are not nuisance zones, where most of the shootings happen, and these liquor stores are owned by Arabs and Asians and white people. None of them are really labeled nuisance zones. You, you, you see what I'm saying? Now they got a black man. His liquor store is labeled a nuisance zone. They're trying to get him out of there. There was a brother who owned a liquor store on Adams. Somebody down the street got shot and they're trying to, again, blame him. They're playing that game on him. It's a real janky game out here, man. They're getting real raggedy with trying to hide that this stuff is anti-black. Yeah? There was a group home that helped black kids, some weird white dude, start living there. All of a sudden, it burned down. Of course, the remember the property, that, that land that we were going to initially get for the museum, that big plot of land? The building there before... That one got mysteriously burned down, right? That building that we were, well, the land that we were going to get, the building that was there before that, it got burned down mysteriously. You think? And then when we try to buy it, we get all types of janky stuff. And also, from what we understood, there were some saboteurs calling these places where we were trying to buy. The white supremacists were sending their Negro flunkies to call some of these places. I don't know what they were talking about, but my folks were telling me that some of these places were getting phone calls by weirdos asking weird questions and saying real funny style stuff when we were trying to purchase these places. That's why I couldn't talk about a lot of stuff. You dig? That's not a coincidence that the white supremacists get their flunkies to go out here to help sabotage. And let's be clear, that woman, the sister at her building, them talking about there were some dudes in there with guns. Who's to say that some city folks or some of the police didn't send some folks up there in that apartment building with guns so that they can target that woman? You know? It's some real funny style stuff that goes on when we start getting into the real estate game out here. All of a sudden, 
we get city ordinances, we get tethers trying to sabotage, we get people who are trying to sabotage in the under the disguise of trolling. You understand? We get a lot of funny style stuff going on. We get the Eric Holder showing up, the haters showing up, trying to pull a twist. The building gets burned down. Remember, with the whole thing with, with Eric Holder, the brother, I, not brother, I, he's not nobody's brother, but the Negro who killed our brother Nipsey, when he showed up, people gave the impression they were putting out that there was some kind of argument that he had with Nipsey. That didn't, it wasn't no argument. There wasn't an argument. According to Cowboy, the dude basically shook their hands and walked off. You dig? The Eric Holder dude, you know, they had some words, but they shook hands and then he walked off. So he didn't walk off hostile and then it escalated. So the dude was, looked like he was just sent in. Yeah? The dude was sent in there. So we got to understand how this game works, man. They do stuff to sabotage us. Yeah? It's real heavy out here. But every other week, we're seeing some black business get hit with a nuisance ordinance. Yeah? So we're taking that in consideration when we're doing our thing out here with the museum. So we're... We're getting it together. We're trying to protect ourselves as much as we can from any type of saboteurs. Yeah, good. Because the saboteurs are already started, by the way. I'm letting y'all know now. They're already getting saboteurs ready. But I digress. Speaking of tethers. Oh, yeah. Aretta Sese. Remember, Aretta Sese is coming up the first foundational black American holiday that we are going to celebrate, ladies and gentlemen, Aretta Sese, December 24th. I hope that we'll have the movie ready so the movie can screen around that time because that'll be a real big push for the Aretta Sese holiday, ladies and gentlemen. We're going to be celebrating our own holiday where we celebrate foundational black Americans who were freeing themselves around Christmas time. That is going to be our own Foundation of Black American holiday that's specific to us. A lot of people have a problem with Kwanzaa, and it's understandable. I'll get on that in a minute. But speaking of um, other cultures, unfortunately, I, I, don't, I don't like to be on some I told you so or whatever. There was another woman who immigrated here She's a Kenyan woman. And she came over here. She moved to, was it Wyoming, I think? Kenyan woman was online and she found a zaddy on Craigslist. And she started dating this creepy white man. And all of a sudden, this sister disappeared. They have not seen that sister. The sister's gone. This sister has disappeared, ladies, ladies and gentlemen. Let me show y'all the story here. Right here. I don't want to be on some I told you so. And we, we try to warn folks, but hey, stay away from the Akatas, right? When we try to warn brothers and sisters from the diaspora, we try to say, hey, man, we really need to focus on white supremacy. Oh, no, you niggas. You niggas just don't work hard. You lazy Akata. I love the white man, you know. We try to warn y'all. We try to let y'all know, hey, man, we under a system of white supremacy, man. You can't you can't be too gaga and goo-gooing. You can't be gaga and goo-gooing over these white supremacists, man. These folks are a problem. No, nigga. All right. All right. So unfortunately, and again, I'm not, you know, taking any satisfaction in seeing what happened to this sister or, you know, because nobody knows. But this sister, unfortunately, she, Irene Gakwa, she moved to the U.S. with big dreams, met a boyfriend on Craigslist, and then she vanished. So she went to Wyoming with this creepy white man. She met him. 
And this is her brother right here and his wife. He has a shirt, where is Irene Gakwa? Chris Munga, all right? So her boyfriend told police she packed her bags and left. So this is her creepy, suspected white supremacist boyfriend. Now family, we all know this look. Foundational black Americans know this look. When you see this look from a suspected white supremacist, we know to stay away, all right? This dude has creepy white supremacist redneck all over his face. Family, my, my non-FBA family, when we, when we talk to you, we try to warn you, y'all better start listening and get off the dumb shit. Y'all get around, let, let, let's keep it a buck. Y'all get around these white folks and think, so, okay, I've arrived, I'm different. I, I'm around white folks and y'all niggas, y'all stay on Twitter spaces hating on us and then go lay up with the real threat. Just like the dude from Nigeria who was with that white woman, the OnlyFans model, and she's up here beating him up and all of that stuff. But we're the Akatas. Him and his family are calling us all types of Akatas. And we, we're like, all right, okay. All right, stay away from us, huh? And the white woman up here jugging him with a knife. And then the family's looking to us after we're all types of Akatas. Y'all stay in the Twitter spaces hating on us. This guy has not been arrested. This, this creepy white supremacist man, he's not been arrested for her disappearance, by the way. All right? Because... Basically, what this dude did, they arrested him for cleaning out her bank account. The dude maxed out all of her credit cards. He deleted all of her social media. You did? So this dude knew he would be safe. His white supremacist card will keep him safe. You did? So check this out with this guy, family. This guy, let me, let me show him. Nathan Heitman, that's his name. Now, he told police when she came home one night, she packed her clothing in two plastic bags and left in a dark color SUV. And he hadn't heard from her since. He also said, hold on, let me let y'all see this. He also said... He withdrew money from her bank account so she would be forced to contact him if she needed money. Okay. All right. Also, he went and bought a bunch of stuff with her credit card. Okay. The police arrest, wait, wait, wait. Heidman, let me show y'all this. Heidman has not been charged with her disappearance. He has not been charged with her disappearance, but he's a suspect in financial crimes against her after she went missing. They arrested him in May and charged him with two felony counts of theft, one count of unlawful use of a credit card, and two felony counts of crime against intellectual property for allegedly changing her bank account password and deleting her email account after she vanished. Man, please. In February, he transferred nearly $3,700 from her bank account to his own and spent an additional amount on her credit card. Man, he also changed her passwords, deleted her Gmail account. Man, yeah, a person, you don't do all this to a person who just left. All right. Where is this one part that I want to find? Her boyfriend allegedly bought boots and a shovel using her bank card. Okay? Cuz that's what you buy. You know, you get some, somebody turns up missing and then you go purchase a boot some boots and a shovel. I'm not laughing, man. It's it, it's 
ironically funny just how obvious this nonsense is. All right? It's just ironic and it's so silly that they stay on code and act like they, they all play dumb with each other. All right? They all play dumb with each other, family. You dig? Then I heard he bought some kind of large drum, but nobody can find the drum. They said he also bought some kind of large drum, but nobody can find the drum. Oh, that's not suspicious at all. But you're not charging this dude with the disappearance or the murder. How obvious can you be? Boy, when, a, when it's a white supremacist male, boy, all the evidence is right there. I'm, I'm, I'm laughing because it's so damn obvious. It's so obvious, guys. The dude was, he put all the evidence on the charge card. And they're still acting dumb. Now, there's the black man that they arrested. This white woman went missing. They never, they don't even found, they haven't found her body. But they arrested this nigga. They didn't need no more evidence. They don't even know, what, is, is she even dead or not? Hold on. Hold on. Hold on. What's that woman's name? They said she's the daughter of a billionaire. Okay. New York Times. Okay. Da, 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 da. Okay. Yeah, they haven't even found this woman's body. They don't know if this, they don't know what happened to this woman. Hold on. Let me find the, the suspect. Hold on. Hold on. Da, 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 da. Let me see. What's this guy's name? Hold on. I'm trying to find this guy's name. Richard Fletcher. He didn't return home. Okay. Yeah, the dude's name is Cleopa. Wait, Cleopa Abston. Hold on. Let me let me find. Hold on. Let me look this dude up. All right. Hold on. Come on, man. Okay. So yeah, this white woman, who's supposed to be the granddaughter of some billionaire, she went missing. She was jogging. In Memphis, this white woman here, man charged an abduction and billionaire's granddaughter. Elijah Fletcher, she was last seen Friday morning jogging in Memphis. She was forced into a dark covered SUV and remained missing. All right? And this is the suspect right here. They don't know what happened to that woman. They haven't found her body, but boy, they didn't already charge this nigga. They already hit him up with aggravated kidnapping, tampering with evidence. They, they found something to charge him with. They ain't gonna let evidence rack up and not have a nigga in custody. We don't know what the fact. Nobody knows what happened with that woman. They don't even know is she is she even dead. Nobody knows. Yeah. Nobody knows. So no, there's zero evidence. Nobody knows anything. They got that nigga locked down. Now this white man sitting up here with shovels on her charge card. He didn't stole all this woman's stuff. Got her over here, stole everything, changed all the passwords. She didn't fell off the face of the damn earth. He didn't bought drums, shovels, and boots. And the police are like, well, we're still trying to look for some leads. All right, Lord. So listen, y'all better stay out of our Twitter spaces hating on us when you have these suspected white supremacists committing these blatant acts and they don't even get punished like that. It takes a whole movement in order for these people to get punished. You dig? They stay on code with each other. You see? They stay on code with each other, ladies and gentlemen. Huh? That's why we got to get on code. Codification is very important, ladies and gentlemen. Codification is extremely important. Yeah? But, you know, my prayers go to the family. I, that's something that, you know, again, I don't take delight in that. But we, we, we tell people, Foundation of Black America, we let people know certain things. You don't, don't walk into some obvious danger. Just like that Jamaican dude who went hunting with them white supremacists up there in, um, in um, Pittsburgh or Pennsylvania. This Jamaican immigrant had some white friends and they were like, hey buddy, you wanna go on a hunting trip in the woods? Show do. 
and then went up there and got shot. And then they came back and said it was self-defense and nobody got charged. Like, man, we could have told you not to take your ass up there. Yeah? Man. So, yeah, that woman right there, that woman going with that creepy white supremacist male, he looks creepy, but y'all be over there, y'all be trying to get a bag. And I see stuff on TikTok and Twitter where you have these immigrant women. I mean, they'll, anything white they'll go with. It doesn't matter. They just go with anything white. Hold on. Hold on. There's this Nigerian chick. Oh, yeah, this Nigerian chick right here who's all with her zaddy. And you got other tethers in here talking about get your reparations, sis. Look at this right here. So this white woman does, this, this Nigerian woman, somebody about get your reparations, sis. Now, she's Nigerian. Now, she's not entitled to reparations, but she sits up here with one of her, her <coughs> old trail. All right, I'm not going to play the audio. So she's up here all booed up with this elderly white man. You see, y'all get with anything white. That's that white worship there. Y'all do the most with these white supremacist folks. So there's a bunch of videos of her with this old elderly zaddy. You dig? There's a ton of videos. Y'all y'all don't know. And I think she got married to him. I think she might have got married to him in the family. Oh, man. You better watch these old zaddies. Now, see, y'all do the most with these damn zaddies. Y'all got to go here and go down the wedding aisle, and you got to lay up with these old decrepit zaddies. And that's the difference between y'all and FBA sisters. Let me tell you something. An FBA sister, FBA sisters got mouthpieces on them. I know some FBA sisters that are spit game at that white man and get every dime he has in a matter of hours without taking their clothes off. I know some FBA sisters with some tight mouthpieces on them. They ain't about to do all that cupcaking and getting married and all that to get a bag. I know some sisters that'll break his goddamn bank account without taking their drawers off. They spit game at that old white man so fast, they have every bank code he has. <laughs> FBA sisters ain't gotta do all that. Yeah. Yeah, she ain't about to get no inheritance. Nigga, I know some sisters, some FBA sisters that'll take that white man out to lunch and come back <laughs> with his whole trust fund, his retirement fund. Oh, I know some sisters with a tight mouthpiece that'll get every dime he has in an hour. <laughs> Yo, y'all be doing the most. Y'all be getting married to these tricks. God damn. I'm not gaslighting, man, but damn, y'all be doing the most. Good Lord. I remember being down in Houston. We're in Houston. We're at a club, and we saw some old white sugar daddies up in there. We saw some of them Houston sisters patting their pockets with their mouthpiece. These sisters were in there spitting at them white dudes. I forgot the name of the club. Them sisters was down there. I'm like, get y'all money. Says them sisters was in there spitting. They were breaking them white men's pockets. You mean? You mean, y'all, y'all foreigners, boy, y'all, y'all be doing the most for the least, man. But much love to you. Get it how you live. Get it how you live. <laughs> Good Lord, y'all going down the aisle with the whites? Uh, y'all ain't got to do that. Y'all be low-key game goofy. Y'all be low-key game goofy. Speaking of game goofy, where's this video? There's this dude. He made this video. This is down in Atlanta. Let me let me let's get into some game for a minute. There's this dude up here clout chasing. He was talking to this um, female police officer right here. And the sister. She was giving him cooperation vibes. The sister was actually, you better know how to read nonverbal energy. The sister was actually giving him some vibe. The vibe was kind of on and popping. 
but he was more concerned with getting some damn internet clout. Now check this out. This is a case study on being game goofy. Hold on. Now listen to this. Hold on. Coming in the multiverse, and I love, I want our love to be paired. Hold on, wait, wait, wait. I want to say you're one of the most beautiful women in the multiverse, and I love, I want our love to be parallel. So, uh, can I have your number? You record me? Yes. I'm going to pass on that. You want to pass? Okay, I need you to just step out of the car and put your hands behind your back now. Yeah. I want to say you want to okay now dude now right now the woman that sister on her little job she's at her job she's doing her thing she was that she's a cute sister she was actually trying to you know she was giving some cooperative eye contact to this goofy ass dude and she found out he was recording she's like no i can't i'm not gonna give you my number on my job she was basically like nigga turn the phone off and he's up here more concerned with getting some TikTok clout Come on, dude, y'all y'all fumble a bag without even trying to fumble a bag. You could have bagged that. Now somebody said, well, he probably couldn't turn the camera off and got a number still. No, no, it ain't the same. The dude already fumbled the bag. The dude already messed up. You ding? Talking about the multiverse and all. Dude, when you're getting cooperation, man, do it. You put your camera down, fool. He was more concerned with getting off his little corny line so he could put it on TikTok. Don't be game goofy, dude. Understand when you're getting some cooperation, fool. I talk about that on my old Mac Lessons show. Sometimes you get in cooperation and you talk yourself out of the cooperation. Damn, dude, you could have you could have had a little something going on there, bruh. But that nigga might have been trying to get some Boochie Cat later. So again, he might have just been out here trying to be goofy just for internet clout. But but just in case, the dude just didn't know better because he sound kind of young and you know just a little game goofy. When you're young, you don't know better. You listen and you learn. All my young dudes, learn how to read nonverbal language. Learn, my young brothers, when you are getting cooperation, how not to fumble the cooperation. If you're getting a good vibe, Less babbling is more. Yeah, that's hard to recover from because now you've already established yourself as a goofy. Family, there's a lot of females that'll give you some good cooperation out here. Don't fumble the bag. Less is more. You can say a little slick line, that whole stuff about the metaverse and all of that. That was a slick little line and you can play that off. Okay, he's being witty and different. Now what's up? That's how the women will look at it. He's being a little witty. He's been a little silly, but uh, that's that's cool. He's playful. Now, what's up? Can I get your number? And she's looking like, well, damn, nigga, put the phone down and stop filming her, man, and maybe something can happen. Yeah, I'm filming. When she said, are you filming? He should have been like, no. Click, and that's when you go ahead and close the deal, fool. She was like, are you filming? Meaning, put the camera down, nigga, and let's, let's handle something. Yeah, I'm filming. Dude, less is more, dude. Stop showing out, man. Once you get some good cooperation, you got to temper your game, man. Temper your game, and Slow it down a little bit. Slow it down. Let the cooperation fall in your lap. Less is more. Yeah? They, they don't know no better. I know, ladies. I know, ladies, the dude, listen to these dudes. Women don't want a nigga trying to hit, out, hit on them while they're filming. That's rule number one. Women don't want a dude trying to spit at them while they're filming. That's one thing women don't want. That's a major turnoff because now that looks like you just clout chasing, which is what you're doing. Women don't like a clout chasing dude because that looks desperate and it looks goofy when there's a man trying to clout chase. When a man just doing stuff to show off to other people. Women like a dude who's spitting low key. That's why you gotta, when you pull and you pull it off to the side somewhere, you in the corner spitting. Women like that, you low key, you ain't putting all your business out there. What you talking about is just between you and her. 
women can respect that. They like a dude who pull them to the side and lace that game down just between them two. Trying to pull on film is corny, it's lame. Go listen to the song Mink Slide, our, our song Phone Down. Put that damn phone down. Even when there's a whole bunch of girls and her friends, pull her to the side. You dig? Pull her to the dance floor. If you had a club, get her a, a, away from the rest of the herd, so to speak. You, you dig? I talked about that, all of that in my old books, The Art of Mackin. If you see a crowd of girls, you pick the one you want and separate her. Get her somewhere where you can chop that game up with her. You don't need all of the, the backups and all of these people jumping into the conversation because some of them might be haters. They might be trying to cock block. I've had that before. I tried to remember years ago, I'm at a club. I'm chopping up game with this chick, and she, she got her little old tubby friend with her. So this girl is giving me mad cooperation. Me and her are hitting it off. We vibing, and her little tubby hating friend is sitting right here. So she gonna bust out, hey, you gonna go buy us some drinks? I'm like, no. Oh, this dude ain't keeping it real, girl. He ain't gonna buy us no drink. These niggas be broken. He, she gonna, she's gonna sabotage the game and then just mess the whole vibe up between me and her homegirl. You dig? So you don't even know if that chick has a hating ass homegirl with her because a lot of them do. There's always that, that donkey mouth ass friend who ain't nobody trying to holler at who will throw salt in their homegirl's game. You dig? So yeah, pull them to the side, get them somewhere. That's why, you know, in my book, I always talked about having your backup man. So if you need to pull somebody to the side, you get your backup homie on the little hating friend or potential hating friend. Even if she's a duck, have them take one for the team just for the sake of the game going good for, for me. And we do each other a solid. See, you got to go in there sometimes as a team. When dudes go in there as a team, y'all work with each other. I don't like when, I've had homies, we went out and we go kick it and then niggas are competing. You trying to holler and then the nigga, your homie low key trying to holler. So now y'all both look goofy doing that. If you try to holler at a chick and you got a homeboy with you and he trying to holler at it too, that makes y'all niggas look lame. I have to cut lame niggas like that off. It looks real lame when dudes try to do that for two reasons. Number one, it looks like dudes are hella petty and catty like bitches if two dudes are trying to undermine each other trying to holler at a girl. Number two, it makes it seem like y'all don't have respect among each other and if y'all don't respect each other, you're not gonna respect the woman. And number three, that puts um, unwarranted value on the woman. So now y'all done made her more of a prize than what she is because now niggas are on here competing for the same chick. So now you've elevated this woman over niggas. It makes you look hella thirsty. So you can't have a, a wingman who tries to undermine you. That's why your wingman, y'all got to go in there, y'all got to be on the same page. If I'm spitting, go holler at the homegirl. If you see me focusing on something, go holler at that homegirl to help me out. If I see you focusing on something, I'll go make sure her homegirl ain't going to do interference on you. I'll go pull the homegirl to the side. Y'all got to work as a team and show respect. Women can respect dudes who operate like that because it makes it seem like you brothers are organized. It makes it seem like you brothers got it together. Women can respect dudes who can come in and be smooth with their game. Wingman rules. You got to understand the wingman rules. You dig? You and your wingman got to be here. And me and my homies, man, we had a good wingman crew. We had a phenomenal wingman crew. We, we would holler at the girls and we wouldn't let their homegirls cock block. We had the homies pull one to the side. Even if she's a duck, keep that duck interested. You, you dig? Conversate with that duck. You got to just take one for the team. It's only temporary. And I got you. I got you. I've had to run interference for some ducks before. I've had to run, I, some of my homeboys, we at the club, he's hollering at a dime and he has, she has a duck homegirl with her. I had to go um, run interference with that duck. I had to go talk to her. And you know, then the ducks start feeling me. I'm like, oh, damn. So your name Tyree, okay. Where you from Tyree? I'm here, I'm here. Oh, cool. 
What y'all doing after this, Tyree? Oh, boys. Okay. I don't know what y'all trying to do. I don't know. I'm trying to see what you're trying to do. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. We might have to go kick it, you know? So what you do for a living? Well, I do security at the mall. Oh, word? Okay. All right. Okay. So you got a man? Uh -uh. Uh -uh. I had a man. He in jail now. Lord. I'm like, what's this? Oh, it's this nigga, hurry up. Oh, it's this nigga, hurry up and so I can get out of here. Oh, hurry up and get this girl number, nigga. Because I don't know what I'm talking to. <laughs> Lord, I got to talk to this damn duck with all of these problems. Oh, God, nigga. <laughs> so, yeah, I had to, had to take one for the team and then the duck. Thinks I'm interested, so now, well, can I get your number, Tyree? Uh, so now I gotta give the duck my number. And I, I can't give her, I gotta give her my, I'm not gonna give her a fake number just in case she try to call me right there, and I don't wanna give a fake number. And then, the, you know, cause sometimes people be like, okay, I'm gonna call you right now so my number be in your phone. They'll, they'll pull that on you. I've had that happen. I had that happen. Ladies, have y'all had that happen, ladies? You try, you give a nigga a number? <laughs> Well, a nigga be like, well, you, you, you look good, girl. Let me get your number real quick. And then, okay, okay, I get my number. Um, 555 five, <laughs> one, two, one, two. Uh, Okay, let me call you right now so you can have my number. And then the nigga called the number. Do, do, do. <laughs> and you look in there. <laughs> you look. Y'all know, what do y'all say, ladies? When a nigga call, when a nigga busts you out like that, what do you say? When a nigga done bust you out right there and you done gave him the fucked up number and you standing, <laughs> what do you say? What do you say next, ladies? When you give a nigga the janky number and he call you and he sees the number is janky, <laughs> do you play it off? Oh, my bad. I gave the wrong number. I'm sorry. <laughs> I was thinking about my work number. I'm sorry. <sighs> Lord. So yeah, you know, what do you do? So yeah, with the with the duck face homegirl, I had you know I, I had to give her my real number, you yeah. know. And then she started calling my ass, leaving messages. Hey Tyree, remember me? I met you at the Century Club, me and my homegirls. I'm just trying to see what y'all trying to get into this weekend. Shit. Call me back. I get off work at the mall at 5 the uh, I got to let the call go to voicemail. Lord. <laughs> Man, but yeah, you got to, sometimes you got to, you got to do your homie a solid. You got to run interference of, with them ducks. You got to run interference. Sometimes you got to pull a duck to the side. And, and, and. Help the homie out because sometimes you're going to need help. You're going to need the homie to come through. When you hollering at a dime, you go, I need you to get me, brother. I need you to come get me. Come help me, bro. <laughs> come on, man. Help me out, brother. Yeah. So that, that's how you work as a team. That's how you work as a team, man. You got to work as a team. I miss the club days sometimes. Some, I miss it, but I don't. I miss the club days, but I don't because, you know, I did all I needed to do in the game. You dig? I did everything I needed to do. You dig? I did everything I needed to do in the game, but sometimes you miss it. Where my, where my old married players? Sometimes you miss the game, and, and, and then you see what's out here right now. You're like, oh, hell no, I, I'm good. I feel for my young brothers out here. I feel for I feel for y'all out here because you don't know what you're getting out here now. You don't know what you're talking to now. Sometimes you be at the club and you dance with somebody and they start grinding up on you and you feel something in their pocket that ain't no money. <laughs> you feel something in their pocket and it's not their wallet, nigga. So yeah, 
I'm good. I'm glad that I was in my generation doing what I was doing because now you don't know what you're getting into. <laughs> you dance with somebody now, you're like, hey girl, your change purse is bumping into me. Like, that ain't no change purse. What the hell am I dancing with? <laughs> Lord. You yeah. in? Yeah. I miss the good old days. Yeah, the good old days back in the late 90s, 2000s. <laughs> when you just, when you met her, the worst you would meet was an undercover freak or somebody who was a pretend freak. That's the, that's the worst you can get back in the day. The pretend freak. Y'all remember those back in the days? The girls who go to the club and act freakier than what they really are, but they're real square and sanctified. They go to the club and do all that grinding on niggas. That was the worst because you, they tease you up and you think you're about to smash. And then you try to get with them and then they goddamn sanctified and they act like church nuns. You know, there was a lot of that going on. The pretend freaks. Yeah. You go to the club and it's the girl at the club, you know, that's when they had that booty music popping real heavy. The girl go to the club, you at the club, you meet a chick, she's all cute, and then you get on the dance floor and she's grinding on you, hella heavy. She got her leg around you, simulating sex. That means damn near you're damn near simulating sex in the club. <clears throat> Excuse me. Y'all are damn near doing it on the dance floor. This woman is doing all types of exotic sexual moves on you, and you in your mind like, nigga, me and this girl are gonna get busy tonight. Shit, you like, she done done all this grinding on you, and you're like, hey, what are you doing later? We need to go somewhere later. What's happening? So, oh, I gotta go to work tomorrow, but call me. Call me tomorrow night, and let's see what we can do. Shit. And, you thinking about all that grinding she was doing. She's doing the butterfly and she's doing splits with her leg on your shoulder. She's doing all types of real freaky stuff on the dance floor. You're like, I ain't never seen that type of shit. Where's she from, Atlanta? Damn. And then you call her ass. And you know the first sign when something ain't right when you call her. She done done all that freaky Dancing on you. Y'all remember back in the day, the late 90s, early 2000s, when people had answering machines or what they would do, they would have music on their answering machines. Remember that? They'd have music on their answering machines when they left a message. Y'all remember that? And you call these girls after she didn't freak you in the club and you trying to get part two. You call up, you're like, let me, let me call, let me call Shereen. Damn, Shireen had all that ass. She was grinding on a nigga. I know she about the business, nigga. Let me see what's going on with her. You call her ass. Hold on. She, you, hold on. What's the, what? Wait, wait. Hello, Hi. This is Laquita. Wait, this is Shireen. Hey, guys. You reached Shireen. I'm not able to take your call right now. I would love to speak with you if the Lord permits. But when I'm done praising the Lord and giving honor to God, I'll give you a call back after these messages. And always remember, put God first. God is your Lord and personal Savior. And no weapon formed against you shall prosper. Beep. So she say that. I don't know what to say. I'm like, um, um, do I have the right number? I'm trying to call the girl with the... Big ass and wet pussy. I don't, I'm sorry if this, this is the wrong number. I don't know who I called. I don't know what to say. I'm trying to be proper. I'm like, I'm like oh, praise the Lord. This is Tariq. <laughs> Bless you, Jesus. This is Tariq. I'm, um, I'm just leaving a message for um, Shireen. You don't know what to say. They throw you off with that bullshit. Like, damn. Where's the freak? And now she's acting sanctified with your ass. And now you ain't getting it. <laughs> this mother, he wasn't no damn real freak. That was a pretend freak. How you gonna tease a nigga like that? 
Lord. Man, come on, girl. I hate them pretend freaks. Don't play games. Because you always notice the real freaks is the little quiet ones. It's the ones who ain't, she ain't dancing, she ain't doing nothing. She's just sitting there, her little old pantsuit on, looking like she's selling insurance. That's the one who's the damn freak, sitting there at the club with glasses on. That's the one you'd be like, hey, what you doing later? I don't know, I'm just chilling. Like, look, let's go, you know, let's go get a little late night bite to eat later. Um, you know, I ain't got to go to work tomorrow, so I don't see nothing wrong with that. So, man, you go, that little old nerdy looking chick in her little business suit with her glasses on. She has a little business suit on, chilling. You get the talking and you go and have a little late night dinner. Then you, you know, you're like, hey, let's, let's go and hit the crib up. You know, I'm, I'm right around the corner. It's kind of late. I don't want you to drive all the way crib. You know? Well, I guess I'll come over there for a minute. Ain't that what y'all be saying, ladies? Yeah, I guess I can come over there for a quick minute, you know, since you close. That's what y'all ladies be saying. I remember what y'all be saying back then. I can go over there for a quick minute, you know. You know dinner was cool, you know. I go over there for a quick minute. You go over there for a quick minute. She come out that pantsuit, and she got all types of titties and ass that you didn't see. Like, your eyes get to bucking. Oh, Lord, Jesus. You built like that? Have mercy, Lord. The eyes get to bucking. Shit. She come out that pantsuit on your ass. And then arch that back down and toot that ass up. Like, whoa, she's ready for business. <laughs> yeah. She thought throwing it on your ass. You're like, damn, I didn't know that was coming from you. Them secret freaks, those are the best ones. Like, damn, your body's done. Your body is like that. I like them kind. You don't know what they look like until they come out them clothes. I'm like, God, damn. You had all of that in that suit? Damn. Yeah? <laughs> yeah, I'm having flashbacks. <laughs> I'm having flashbacks, nigga. Man. Yeah, those are the ones that'll low key turn your ass out. Some of them undercover freaks. Them undercover freaks. You done met you an under, undercover freak and she didn't turn your damn ass out. You did. You, you didn't know she was an undercover freak. You thought she was she was gonna turn you out, and then you got with that chick and she didn't put that undercover body on your ass. She throwing that coochie a certain way that you ain't never seen before. She had some kind of signature move. She done done some shit to you. Then all of a sudden you thinking niggas. Damn, man, I need to settle down. I'm out in the streets too much. You know what? I've been in the game too long. You know what? Damn. You have one of them undercover freaks that make you rethink the game? Like, God, you know, I need to let the game. I need to be. My mama said I need to settle down and shit. I, I do. I really do. You know, I need to get a new job at the, as a job at the plant. Damn. Damn. I'm out here in the streets fucking up because ain't nothing better than this motherfucker I just had right here. You get there, yeah, they pussy whoop your ass. Them square ass chicks end up pussy whooping your ass. And then all of a sudden, when girls call your phone, you done put a message on your phone. Girls call you, some of your other freaks call, and then you got this on the phone. Hey, this is Tyreek. I'm not here right now, but I'm glad to have you calling me and I'm somewhere praising the Lord. Because the Lord is my personal savior, and I found I found refuge in the heart of Jesus. But li leave a message, and I'll be glad to call you back after I'm through praising His glory. Thank you so much, guys, and remember Jesus loves you too. <laughs> your ass is up here sending a gospel message to your other freaks. <laughs> oh, yeah. Lord, <laughs> you done fucked around and got turned out. It's always them little old secret freaks that are turning the guy out. You're like, huh, damn. <laughs> but anyway, 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 let me get out of here, guys. Anyway, it's been real, man. We had a great conversation tonight, man. Thank everybody for tuning in. How long? I've been on here for a few hours, man. I've been chopping it up with you guys for a minute. 
we got a lot of folks in here. But anyway, y'all, that's been it. Um, go to officialfba.com to get your FBA flags and all that good stuff, family. Um, go to hiddencolorsfilm.com to get Hidden Colors 1 through 5. Go to buckbreakingmovie.com to get the film Buck Breaking. I'm up out of here, man. Much respect to the family. Thank you guys.